So I hated life because the work done uh, that is done under the sun was grievous, grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had to toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. Yet he will have control over all the work into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This, too, is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a man may do his work with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then he must leave it all, leave all he owns to someone who has not worked for it. This, is, this too, is meaningless and a great misfortune. What does a man get for all the toil and anxious striving with which he labors under the sun? All his days... All his days his work is pain and grief. Even at night his mind, mind does not rest. This too is meaningless. A man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his work. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? That's a central part of this text, by the way. To the man who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. As we talked about last time when we discussed the book of Proverbs, we noted the fact that, uh, a lot of podium pounding, that, it, that, Sol that, that Israel's worst king was not Ahab, it was Solomon. Solomon was given absolutely every advantage. He was given spiritual, parental, economic, militaristic, and social advantages unparalleled in history. He was also given favor by God and a tremendous amount of wisdom and knowledge. But Solomon never applied all of his God-given wisdom to himself or his life. Solomon effectively, effectively violated every one of the Proverbs that he wrote. Think about that. He directly violated about 18 of them. Just straight up violation. But, it, but in principle, he violated them all. Solomon undid all of the spiritual good that his father, King David, had done. David had led the nation in a spiritual movement towards the worship of God and away from their idolatry. And David uh, ruled for uh, 40 years. And so during that time, he was able to undo the damage from the book of Judges that the Israelites had gotten into a habit of consistent, institutionalized idolatry. Well, David undid that. The nation's headed in the right direction. Solomon comes along, full of God's wisdom, full of his knowledge, able to write one pithy little epitaph after another in the book of Proverbs, and applies none of it. Ignored it all. It's incomprehensible how incompetent and foolish Solomon was. <clears throat> the destruction of both the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah can be traced back to Solomon. Because it was because of his idolatry that the, both nations ended up collapsing. Solomon reigned in Jerusalem and then on out from there. Solomon had 700 wives. Think about that. Even if you have a wife every night, you're not going to see them for two years. Almost two years. It's incredible. He violated the old law of Moses in just about every way you can. And on top of it, as I said before, he violated all of his own problems. He ringed Jerusalem for as far as the eye could see with temple after temple after temple. It wasn't that there were 700 of them because some of the wives were from the same country and from the worship of the same God. But however many temples those 700 wives represented, that's how many temples he put around Jerusalem and then led the Israelites to worship those gods as well. What a scumbag. What a loser. What a fool. And I'm not going to go back and preach, re preach that sermon about Proverbs and Solomon's failure, but his failure was epic. Ecclesiastes was written at the end of his life, and it functions as a confession of a sort. It really isn't. It's sort of a pseudo-confession. It's, it's, it's an attempt at somewhat. <clears throat> the book of Proverbs and the book of Song of Songs were written at the 
pin a pedicle on the peak of his career as a king. And then the Ecclesiastes at the end. Ecclesiastes is a book filled with regret and misery. And even though it is a confessional of Solomon, it falls way short of being an effective confession of sin. I want us to understand the function of sin. We die in this life because we're sinners. But the effect of God coming into our life, us accepting Christ uh, and the blood that covers our sin, just I'm going to make this very quick and brief because I don't want to do an expose of the book of Romans. Because Romans really deals with this. But when you and I confess sin, that death effect from that sin is removed from us now. Yeah, 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 yeah. We die, our, we die because we're sinners and we go to heaven. And then that, the, the full expression of God's life in us is given to us after we die. But the beginning of the light and the life of God starts when we confess sin, repent, and accept Christ. That life starts to flow. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know this one. When we come to Christ, we repent to the best of our ability and our knowledge, and we confess sin. But that's just the beginning. I've said this before. The function of Christian maturity is to become more and more and more aware of sin and its consequences for ourselves and for the people around us, and then on out to the lost. And God doesn't usually hit us with a full revelation of our sin and of its consequences all at once. He just, you know, the process of our maturity is He unwraps it over time. I don't think that we could handle it. I don't think anyone could handle it. If, uh, if God just gave it, get the full package all at once. If we are fully confessed Christians before God, then all of our sins are forgiven and the death effect associated with them is removed. Amen. I'm a little ahead of myself and, well, I'm not off topic, but I'm a little ahead of myself, but I just want to emphasize this. One of the ways that we are powerful witnesses to a lost and dying world is that they can see in us the removal of that death effect that comes from sin. Sin is death, death is sin. When you sin, it, death enters in. If all the sin that we have is confessed, Repent of it. God removes it. Amen. And we should stand in contrast mm -hmm. with a lost and dying world. Okay. <clears throat> Unconfessed sin keeps the expression of death on us. Mm -hmm. Confessing sin removes death and gives us life. Many passages in the New Testament talk about that and a few in the Old. Solomon spent all of his adult life with an ever increasing, with ever increasing amounts of unconfessed sin. He did not obey the old law, the law of Moses, and he didn't obey his own proverbs. One of the things we need to understand is that as Christians, if we do not take ourselves to task, God will. <clears throat> God will start to use the circumstances of our life to confront our unconfessed sin. Sin, And that is what we see in our passage here with Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon spent his entire life pursuing things of the flesh and of carnal desires. And believe you me, he did not deny himself anything. I really don't even go down the path of his pornographic pursuits and everything else that he did. But he did it. If he felt like it, he did it. So God confronts Solomon by taking away his ability to enjoy his pursuits. Hear me when I say that. God had promised Solomon that he would have great wisdom and knowledge. But he then, because of his sin, removes his joy or his ability to enjoy it. Let's look at verse 26 again. And this is the end of our passage. And we're kind of going to move backwards through our passage. So let's start with verse 26. What does verse 26 say? It says, to, to the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering up and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. 
There are three things that Solomon says that God gives the godly person. Wisdom, knowledge, happiness. God had already promised Solomon that he would have great wisdom and knowledge. That's not going to be pulled back. But what God did pull back was happiness. Solomon is a miserable wreck when we get to him in the book of Ecclesiastes. Because he has pursued every carnal thing. He has tons of building projects that he went out on and uh, all kinds of stuff that he did. Uh, nothing wrong with that kind of stuff necessarily. We'll get to what, what that represents for us here in a minute. But the third one is the one that God removes. God removes Solomon's ability to find any satisfaction in his many projects. And that removal of happiness came through God's wisdom that he had given him. Think about that. So Solomon starts to realize that all earthly pursuits are meaningless. They are just like chasing the wind. Amen. Solomon starts to realize that all of his various ventures are going to become dust in the wind. And then he is going to become dust in the wind when he dies. He just, throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, says it's chasing the wind. This is meaningless. This is despairing. This is heartbreaking. This is so wrong. Blah, 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 blah. And on and it goes. Solomon is also confronted by God through his son Rehoboam. Rehoboam is the crown prince going to take over after he dies. And God confronts Solomon through his son. Let's look at verses 18 and 19. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to one to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool, yet he will have control over all the work into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. Solomon is pretty bold here. In, in, in the old Near East way of writing, we don't see it that way. But that is a bold statement. The way that Solomon writes it here, he says, I don't know if my son's going to be a fool or a wise person. No, 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 no. When they wrote like that, that's a bold-faced confrontation. My son is a fool! <laughs> that's what he's saying. It is, it is bold. And, 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 and <laughs> Solomon is being confronted with the fact that Rehoboam, who was the son of a princess from Ammon, and Ammon was a terrible country. And so when Solomon says, I don't know if the person that comes after me, I don't know. Have you guys ever been around a lot of Jewish people? When they want to confront somebody, what do they do? Pay attention to this. Pay attention. When, 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 when it comes, they start asking questions. And the questions are not meant to be questions that they don't know the answer to. They are questions that are meant to highlight the failure of the person. Well, I don't know if he's going to make it in business. I don't know if he has the acumen to be able to pull off this business. That's the way they talk. And when they're doing that, they're confronting. That's saying, what they're saying is, <laughs> you suck. Basically, I said that. They're, they're saying, hey, you, 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 you don't have the, the, the ability to succeed here. You do not have the acumen. When you see Solomon asking the questions, I don't know if the person that comes after me is a, going to be a fool or a wise man. What he's saying is, my son Rehoboam is a fool. And when Rehoboam became king, he proved that he was a total fool. He causes uh, most of the tribes, ten of the tribes, to civil war themselves away. They become the northern kingdom of Israel. And Rehoboam is left with only two tribes, Simeon and Judah. So he loses two-thirds, three-quarters of the nation instantly, almost as soon as he becomes king. He... <clears throat> Once again, it's very important, it's so very important that we live before God completely confessed Christians. Otherwise, we will find ourselves in the same position as Solomon did. We will be confronted with our unconfessed sin through the circumstances of life. What a tragedy it is for us as Christians if the only way God can get us to recognize our sin is to confront us publicly and graphically through the circumstances of life. God doesn't want to do that. 
I've said this before, but it bears much repeating. As long as we are seeking to be fully confessed before God, God will not publicly confront us. The sin and whatever he's dealing with us about will remain just between us, me and him. It never goes outside that circle. The second we decide that we're not going to grow in our faith, which, once again, true maturity, there's all kinds of things that people look at and say, well, this person's a mature Christian. Nah, 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 nah. That maturity, at its core, has to be defined by the fact that the person has come to grips with their sin in totality. If that's not a part of their maturity, then they're not mature. So what do I mean? Uh, because I've talked about this before, but this sermon is about this, at least in part. What do I mean about being a fully confessed Christian? What does that mean? It means not only to confess sin, but to own it. Every Christian should be able, the power of the Holy Spirit, be able to look back over their lives and connect the dots to cause and effect. I sinned here, cause, and here's the consequence, effect. This is what I did, sinned, cause, and this is how it affected me and the people around me, effect, the, the, the consequence. The mature Christian is a person who has dealt with sin in both its cause and effect in their lives. They understand in totality where they have sinned and are fully aware of the effects that it had. The process of Christian maturity is an ever-increasing brokenness before God. I've said that many times. <clears throat> when we come to Christ and get saved, we confess our sin to the best of our knowledge and understanding. And God accepts us. But the process of Christian maturity is an ever deeper understanding of sin in our lives and its cause and effect and, and then God starts to move it out around from us and he starts to show us the sins of others and that cause and effect and one of the downsides to this is and I've encountered this several times and multiple times as a person grows near to God the holiness of God starts to become very prominent in our life. They're actually drawn near to God. They're drawn near to His holiness. That's what they're going to draw near to. And when that happens, it exposes their sin, their sin nature, their sin, cause and effect, consequences, so, so forth. And then God starts to show them their fellow brothers and sisters. And it's usually in that moment, I remember a lady back at the time of the seven. Man, she came to me. She was lit. Man, she was mad. These people, these Christians around, I didn't realize they were so screwed up. Man, they're a bunch of morons. They're fools. I think they're going their way to hell. You know, she rants and raves about the sin that God had revealed to her. <laughs> but I said to her, I said, let's go back to when God revealed your own sin. You better calm yourself. Because you cannot stand in that harsh judgment of your brothers and sisters when God has already revealed to you your sin. <clears throat> anyway. <clears throat> the process of Christian maturity, ever deepening understanding of sin and cause and effect, <coughs> and it isn't just about sin that's committed before we were saved. That, that, that's kind of a that's not right. We're sinners. And the process of God working out his salvation in us, which is called sanctification, removing sin from us is that we continue to sin. And so as Christians, there's still more sin. There's still more cause and effect. <laughs> um, but as God does his sanctifying work and makes us aware and we are open to it, that's the big problem. A lot of Christians are not open to it. And we are open to hearing his voice Say, this is where the sin is, this is what you did, and this is the effect, this is the consequences for that sin. As that process goes along, it has a cleansing effect. Amen. Because we start to look at ourselves and say, you know what, I don't want any more of the consequences. My dad says it this way, when you choose to sin, all you're doing is choosing the consequence. Right. Might as well just short circuit through the process, and as soon as you choose the sin, you have chosen the consequence. So it's kind of like going shopping. It's a whole shelf full of nasty consequences. Well, I think I'll have this consequence. Sure. And you say, no, no, I'm, I, I wasn't choosing the yeah, yeah, that's exactly what you're doing. You're choosing the consequence. When you choose the sin, you're choosing the consequence. 
<clears throat> Solomon could never bring himself to fully own his own sin and the cause and effect of it. He had some glancing blows throughout the book of confession, but he doesn't bring it all the way home. Listen to Ecclesiastes 1.18, right in the front part of the book. Solomon is kind of sort of headed there. Listen to it. Listen to Ecclesiastes 1.18. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. Kind of, kind of going there. Kind of, kind, of, kind of getting there. With his overwhelming wisdom, he has come to the realization that he has messed up big time. And he declares that his great wisdom has brought him great grief. Why? Because he realizes that he has sinned like no one else ever has before. But Solomon just leaves it there. He leaves it as a little pithy epitaph, a little proverb. With much wisdom comes much sorrow. But he doesn't connect the dots. He doesn't go back and say, this is where I sinned. And this is the consequence. You go on down the book a little bit. Chapter 7. Solomon gets a little closer. Ecclesiastes 7.26 says this. I find more... Remember when I was talking about he married 700 wives? Have that in the back of your head as I read this. I find more better than death the woman who is a snare, whose heart is a trap, and whose hands are chains. The man who pleases God will escape her, but the sinner she will ensnare. Is he not declaring that he messed up marrying 700 wives? And is he not declaring that he's a sinner? Because he fell for it. He understands that these wives of his have led his heart astray. But instead of owning the sin and giving a full confession of his sin and of the consequences of that sin, he just keeps it as a proverb. Keeps it as a little pithy epitaph. Solomon just can't bring himself to own his sin and its consequences. So he just keeps his words as pithy little platitudes. Solomon fails to do what his father David did. Psalm 32, 5. This is David speaking. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave me the guilt of my sin. These were the words of King David. <laughs> Sprinkled out throughout David's writings in the, in the Psalms, uh, every so often is a confession of sin. And every time, David totally owns it. Totally confesses it. Sin, that's what I did. Cause and effect, or effect over here, this is what it did. Probably the most famous of his confessions is in Psalm 51, where he wrote the psalm as a confession of two sins. He acknowledges that he's guilty of mur murdering Uriah the Hittite in order to cover up his other sin, the adultery with Bathsheba. And so Psalm 51, 3 and 4 says this, For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. He's speaking to God. One of the truths of Scripture that is largely lost in our modern church is that we not, do not have the understanding of what confessing sin means. We have to own it. We have to own its cause and effect. <clears throat> In fact, a part of the definition, biblically speaking, of the word confess is to own the effects. If we don't, then we haven't dealt with our sin before our holy God. When it comes time for sentencing a murderer, the judge will usually allow the murderer to make a statement. And what is that statement about? It's about confessing to killing someone. And it is about the consequences it caused because they cut short someone's life. And the consequences to the relatives and friends around. The judge and the family want to hear a full ownership of the murder and its consequences. And so it is with God. Solomon knew his sin, but he didn't confess it and he didn't own it. If you just want to purview the 12 chapters, you have that in the, in the back of your mind as you're looking at how he just kind of glances in and out of opportunity to say what he needed to say. Confessing of the sin, 
owning of the consequences, and he backs off every time. Thusly, by the time we see Solomon in Ecclesiastes, he is a miserable old man that sees that all that he has done and all that he has is a foolish waste of time. And that he's a son. Solomon is an example of what we as Christians can become if we don't take seriously the scriptural mandate to completely own our sin. The word confess in scripture has a deeper meaning than it does in our modern Christianity. Listen to Leviticus 5, 5 and 6. Listen very closely and see if you can connect the dots. Here it is. Leviticus 5, 5 and 6. When anyone is guilty of any of, any of these ways, he must confess in what way he has sinned, and as a penalty for the sin he has committed, he must bring to the Lord a female lamb or goat from the flock as a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for him for his sin. Now, we don't sacrifice goats and sheep anymore. But all of the principles of the Old Testament still apply to us. The old law does not, but the principles do. <clears throat> I've talked about this before. The process of repenting of a sin in the old law was to bring an animal into the tabernacle or the temple. Whatever. And this is how it would go. Here's the sheep. The person who has come, and this is done in, usually, the, the, especially at the tabernacle, uh, the courtyard would be full of people every day, pretty much every day. Uh, there was always a crowd there to sacrifice various sacrifices and or just to come in and enjoy the service every day. So you'd have, now depending on when you talk about the, 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 the tabernacle courtyard wasn't as big as the temple courtyard, but the temple courtyard was huge. And so you could get maybe up to a thousand people in there. So, up on the steps of the temple or of the altar, the priest would have the person come, and they would declare, they'd put their hand on the animal, and they would declare in a loud voice, in detail, what they did wrong. And they're telling the whole world. The priest would hand them a knife. They would take the knife. They would slit the throat of the animal. And the animal would be burned. What that teaches us is confession is both confessing the sin and understanding what the consequence was. That person is directly tied to what they know the consequence was. The animal lost its life, and it lost its life because that person that confessed the sin killed him. Does that make sense? And that is a principle of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. Confession of sin is not just saying, I did this wrong. It's an owning of the consequences and the effects. There's been times in my life, this is not a metaphor, where I have had to get on my knees in front of somebody, confessed my sin with no nuance, no excuses, no, I was going through something at the time, there's nothing like that, I screwed up. And I've had to take their hand and beg their forgiveness because the consequence of my sin had a direct impact on them. I had to own the consequence. I had to own it. I had to confess the sin to them. No nuance! Wow, we're good at that. No. I messed up. This is how I messed up. And then I described to them how it impacted them, and how I knew that it had impacted them. Once again, no excuses. No trying to sidestep it. But you know, yeah, no. This is how I messed up. Boom. And I messed you up because of my sin. And I'm sorry. <clears throat> How many times have I heard Christians say, 
Well, it's all under the blood now. Okay. All right. That's not an inaccurate statement. But have you owned it? Did you go back and talk to the person that you hurt, if that happened to be the case, whatever it was? Did you own it? Did you own it from the top to the bottom, from the left to the right, inside and out, and all the way around? Because if you didn't, you didn't confess. That's right. God forgives sin yeah. when it is confessed. Amen. And there's great peace and liberty in not being in that position where we're blind to our sin. That's right. If we go along in our lives, this is what happens to us as human beings. We go along our lives just like Solomon. And it's easy to get into this mode where we can become blind to our sin. We become blind to the sin and we become blind to the consequence of the sin. But God is not. Sure. That is a very dangerous place to be. Yeah. I said this before. I don't want to go too far back down this path, but I want to mention it again. A month ago, in a sermon, I said I was sitting in a hotel room in Ashland because I couldn't make it back across the hill because there's too much snow. I'm not a morning person. There were many things that the Lord confronted me with uh, in, in terms of not my, not my sin, but just He was speaking to me. And you know, I'm a million miles away. I'm not there's a lot of thoughts to go through my mind when I'm trying to sip coffee and get the computer up and running, so to speak. But I'll share with you two. He said, and he was speaking nationally. He says, my people are not broken before me. He says, and they're unaware of their sin. They have not confessed their sin, and they're unaware of it. And they're not broken. And I'm looking at my coffee cup. Anyway. I'm not God, and I don't make decisions on people's souls. But I get very concerned when I see people. Let me give you some examples. How many parents have I run into? Uh, there's so many examples. The dad beat his two boys when they were kids. He becomes a Christian. He repents of his sin. But he never goes back and owns it. He doesn't go back to his sons and say, I am a sinner. I beat you. That was wrong. I'm sorry. That's Christianity right there. Amen. How many times have I seen, I've lost track. Parents of children, they're praying for their children's salvation. But guess who's standing in the way of it? That parent is. Because that parent never owned the sin that they committed against their child. You and I do not want to be standing. I'll tell you what, I don't want to be standing before God and find out that I stood in the way of whoever it was of making heaven their home. I've seen... Two boys raised in church, Christians. They get older, early 20s, and they go back to their mother to confront her about her sin committed against them. It was amazing. <coughs> she would not own it. And she was a daily or a weekly person that was devoted to God sitting in a pew. Look! You have to connect. The sin has consequence. It always does. You've got to connect the dots. And you've got to own it all the way down the line. Amen. Where's the consequence? Did you cause the problem? I'll take one step further before I move on. It's not the only reason. There's multiple reasons why God doesn't answer prayer, at least at the time that we think He should. And particularly when we're talking about lost souls. But we've got to remove ourselves out of the equation. We've got to make sure that we're not the reason why our lost loved ones are not coming to Christ. Because that happens a lot. Oh, I've been in so many situations. Not so much here. 
Plan with the simple. God would not, you know, I would say, Lord, you get open the door for me to speak to this person about this. And he'd say, no, leave him alone. Pray for him behind the scenes. Don't, don't say anything. They're praying fervently for the law, for the salvation of their child. And they are the very reason their child will not come to Christ. In that situation where that mother would not own her <coughs> sin against her two boys, they were in church, they were headed into ministry, and they backslid. Why? Mom wouldn't know her sin. She wouldn't confess. How horribly hard would it have been, and it would have been hard, for Solomon to acknowledge his sin and its consequence to God and the nation. Because what he had done was horrific. He would have had to acknowledge that he had grossly violated the law of God. He would have had to acknowledge that he led the nation of Israel into the idolatry, the gross idolatry that he had been into. He would have had to admit that marrying 700 wives was a sin. He would have had to have admitted that he violated the law of Moses and that he violated all of his own proverbs. And he would have had to own the fact that his life had been a train wreck of sin and lust and carnal pursuits. But what would have happened if he did? What kind of a story would we have in Scripture if Solomon had owned his sin? If the book of Ecclesiastes was 12 chapters of the greatest repentance in human history, God would have forgiven his sin. God would have healed the nation. And we would have an entirely different story about Israel. But he didn't. He got close, but he couldn't bring himself to do it. The sin and its consequences would have been washed away. He would have led the nation back to repentance. And it's very possible that the nation would not have suffered a civil war of a sort and split it to Let's talk about, before I move on here, Christian churches are supposed to be full of Christians that are fully confessed. Why? Well, one of the reasons is that new Christians come in, and they are all tied in knots and have a lot of issues. Well, when you have fully confessed Christians, and somebody comes to that older, mature Christian and says, man, what am I going to do about this? Immediately they say, well, this is what I did. This was the consequence for it. You need to go on. Boom. Boom. Problem solved. But what you end up with is the people that I just talked about a minute ago. That mother. And so many more like that. Another thing that we need to learn from Solomon's bad example is the importance of following God. Solomon spent his whole life doing what he wanted to do. Solomon didn't care one whit what it was that God had in mind for his life. Solomon took on one building project after another, and he married one wife after another. And none of it was with the idea in mind that he was following God. Look at verses 24 and 25. I'm going to read it again. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat and find enjoyment? Once again, Solomon makes glancing blows towards confession. He realizes that he never pursued what God wanted him to pursue. All of his interests and pursuits were selfish and or carnal. <clears throat> and as I said before, there was no satisfaction in his work or his wives. It was dead and it was empty. Why? Because he never considered what it was that God wanted him to do. So what can we learn from this? Well, when was the last time we sought God out to find out what he wants us to do? And I'm not just talking about stuff in the church. Let me just quickly talk about that, though, just for a moment. Biblically, God wants every member of a church, every person that attends church, to in some way, small as it might be, small as it might be, God wants every person to be serving others in the church in some way. It can be big or it can be very small. It doesn't matter. God has something. If you're still breathing, God has if I may put it this way, ministry for you to fellow brothers and sisters. Amen. <clears throat> but it goes on beyond that. We need to ask God some questions. Where do you want me to work? Where do you want me to live? 
What girlfriend or boyfriend, husband or wife do you want me to have? Are we happiness? There's, there's, there's two words here in our passage um, uh, that I like. It says satisfaction and happiness. If we're not following in, in, in a place of satisfaction and of happiness, maybe we haven't asked ourselves if we're in the middle, middle of God's will. We always want to be in the middle of God's will. Amen. Sure. Amen. How many know that it's hard to be a pastor? How many know that? One, two. You all should have your hands up. I'm reminded of this every so often. That I need to be in the middle of God's will. If I'm not in the middle of God's will, I'm going to be miserable. I'm going to be solemn. I'm going to be unsatisfied. There's not going to be any joy. Why? Because I'm outside of the will of God. God has for us in our lives, you know, they talk about ministry, hey, 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 yeah, whatever. Forget that for a moment. Forget pastors, forget ministry. God has a will in your life that He wants you to follow. And we need to know what it is. Amen. Do we ask? Do we follow? Do we say? <clears throat> I want to move on because I'm running out of time. As I've said before, and I try in every one of these books, I don't always do it, but I try in every one of these books to point passages, our passage, having expression in the New Testament. Everything that is in the New Testament was written from the Old Testament. It all has its root system in the Old Testament. Listen to Timothy's teaching in 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10. Listen how it ties in with the book of Ecclesiastes. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves through with many griefs. Do you think Paul had uh, Solomon in the back of his head? Ecclesiastes might have been right there. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Paul teaching, once again. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, working as for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. You think Paul might have had Ecclesiastes in the back of his head? Our passage. And the whole book. I think so. Once again, when you read the New Testament, remember, it, it, it can be a fun thing to do. It can be very, you know, you may not want to do the whole book, but, or the whole Testament, but whenever you're reading any portion of the New Testament, say, God, where is this found in the old? Because that can be very helpful to you uh, in understanding Scripture. <clears throat> what is grievous in this world is for someone to pursue life instead of God. Because if they do, they will find themselves in the same position as some at the end of their lives. And many times before the end of their lives. They will be filled with regret. To pursue life without God is just an ongoing study of piercing oneself through with many griefs. This should be part of our motivation to bring people to Christ as soon as possible in their lives. Because pursuit of anything in this life without God is just going to pierce you through with a lot of griefs. It's going to come back and bite you. <clears throat> Once again, we should be a great witness to a watching world. We should be the very epitome of satisfaction and of joy and of enjoyment. Amen. I hate the fact that the world absconded with the word party. Hey man, we're going to party. No, Christians should own that word. We should be the ones who know how to party and have a good time. But the world is taking that away from us. But it should be that we are the very epitome of satisfaction and of joy and we stand in contrast with a world that is not. Listen to Verses 22 and 23 again. Let's read them again. What do people get for all the toil and anxious, anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days their work is grief and pain. Even at night their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. What is it that defines us as Christians? 
Does that passage define you? Do you find yourself being a person with anxious striving, laboring, full of grief and pain, and at night you can't shut your head down, your mind? It should not define us. That should be the definition of the world, and we should stand in stark contrast with it. Amen. <clears throat> But if we find that we look more like the world in this regard, then maybe we are not in the will of God. Let me say it another way. If we want to be happy, we have to be in the middle of God's will. Amen. If we want to find satisfaction and enjoyment, we have to pursue the will of God. Amen. Solomon failed God. He failed God miserably. Let me just say something, because this is my closing statements. Sin is not the, the big deal in our world, so to speak. What's the big deal in our world is a lack of repentance, is a lack of confession. We're all sinners. Everybody in this room and everybody that's going by on the highway out there, the entire planet is nothing but sinners. We're all sinners. Sin, in some ways, if you want to put it this way, is neutral because we're all sinners. Not neutral because it's awful, but... It's, it's neutral in the sense that we're all sinners. The, the missing component is confessing and repenting of sin. That's where we come in as Christians. We demonstrate and we are examples of confession and repentance and acceptance of Christ. Amen. Solomon has sinned his brains out for almost all of his life. But he had a chance to confess and own his sin. But then he failed again. Because he failed to confess and he failed to own it. Ecclesiastes is a reflection of both of these failures. This book could have been the book that we hand out to people uh, for the sake of salvation. It could have been the book of Solomon owning his horrible, gross, terrible sins. And God, at the end of the book where he says that this is what God did to restore and to heal and to bless and to keep and so I've taken too much time. Stand with me. Solomon failed to pursue God and his will. This led to a terrible and miserable end to his life. Have we confessed and owned all of our sin? Are we aware of all of our sin? Are we maturing in Christ by becoming more and more and more aware of sin and its consequences? both in our lives and in the lives of those around us. I'm going to say a prayer. And when I say this prayer, I want you, if, you, if, you, if you're unaware of any sin and consequences, cause and effect in your life, okay? Ask God, show me my sin. Ask God, where have I failed in the cause and effect, the confession, and the repentance of sin? I tell you what, I said before, there's great peace, there's great joy, there's great freedom in walking. As a Christian, we should be able to walk around in the freedom of Christ. I am fully confessed and have owned everything. I don't care. Let me tell you something. The people that I've had to bow my knee to were half my age, a third my age. They were nobody. But I gotta own it. As I pray this prayer, I want you to ask God to reveal your sin. It takes time. And in doing so, that you're gonna have the attitude in your heart that when He does, you're gonna own it, and you're gonna confess it, and you're gonna repent of it. Lord, I thank you for this time, for these people, yes, Father. for this church, for this day. I thank you, Lord, for everything. I pray, Father, that you will move in our hearts. Lord, reveal our unknown sin. Lord, reveal to us what it is that you have issue with that we've forgotten about or that we have purposely blinded ourselves to. Lord, where is it? What is it, Lord, in our sin, Lord, that we don't know about that's actually maybe standing in the way of our answered prayer? Lord, get us out of the way. Lord, I pray, Father, because we're coming to you purposefully and not having it forced on us, 
Lord, let it be that you will keep it just between you and me, or you and, 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 and your people. Lord, that it won't be some sort of public display. Lord, whatever it is, Lord, I pray that you will deal privately with us and show us and reveal to us, and Lord, that we will own it. We will confess it. And if there is somebody that we have to go talk to, Lord, that we'll go talk. We'll get on our knees and beg forgiveness. I pray, Father, that we will be people that are fully confessed, fully free. Lord, that the freedom that we walk in becomes this magnet to the world around us. Because he whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And I pray, Father, that we will be free indeed. I pray, Father, that you go with us and that we will, that we will ask, Lord, every day, we will ask, yes. reveal my sin and help me to repent. If, if there is nothing, Lord, I pray that you reveal that as well. If all sin has been confessed, Lord, let them maybe rise up in great joy and peace and freedom and say, I am a fully confessed Christian. Well, whatever the case, Lord, I pray that you reveal to us, whether we're fully confessed or whether we're not, that we know. I pray, Father, as you go with everyone that is here, demonstrate your love in some significant way throughout this week to those that are here and those that couldn't be here. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Amen.